Yes, Mr. Rank's uh, sermon last week on blood uh, gave me the idea for my message. Um, he quoted a scripture in, in 1 John uh, chapter 5, and verse 6, and it says there that this is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. Now, it's interesting that this that he used this scripture and how it talks about water and blood. And it really points out that it was talking about, he was talking about Jesus Christ being a man. And it's really important to understand that Christ came as a human being. Now, John, when he wrote this, was fighting against people who were wanted to say that Christ was not a, really a man, and so, you know, they, they were trying to make that argument. Well, if that was the case, that Christ wasn't a man, then we wouldn't, our sins would not be forgiven. So it's a very important scripture, and it points out how people twist things. They try and twist scripture to fit whatever they want, but uh, this is really also important for us, I think, if we think about it fully. Because if we claim that we know Christ, we know that we can overcome just as Christ overcame all things. He was perfect. But this gives us the opportunity to also uh, overcome. Now, this idea between blood and water, or blood, is really woven throughout the Bible, as we saw last week with Mr. Rank's message. It's interesting how all these uh, concepts are stitched together. But today I want to go through how water plays a significant role in our lives and how interlaced it is throughout the Bible. But to start, I'm going to start off with a pop quiz. Now, those of you sitting here in front of me, I've given you each a paper, so you can pull that out now and take a look at that. Those of you who are watching the video stream, I have uh, put it up on the screen. And so I'm just going to uh, quickly read through these, and you can answer them. Um, so the first question is, of all the water on Earth's surface, how much of it is suitable for drinking in percentage? Number two, does water regulate the Earth's temperature? Yes or no? Three, how long can a person live without food and without water? Is it a day, a week, a month, a year? Four, what percentage of the human body is water? Number five, what percentage of the Earth's surface is water? Number six, what does the human brain and trees have in common? And number seven, besides bones, what else is left from the dinosaur age? I'm going to start giving you the answers here. If you had answered uh, number one at 1%, 1 you would be correct. You see, 97% of the world's water is salty. It's undrinkable. Another 2% is locked in ice caps and in glaciers. And so that leaves us with just 1% for all of humanity's needs. If you think about all the agriculture, all the residential, all the manufacturing, personal needs, it's truly incredible to think that we only have 1% of water to use. And without this 1%, none of us would actually be alive. Number two, the answer is yes. Water does regulate the Earth's temperature. Number three, a person can live without food for more than a month. But without water, a human being can only survive about one week, depending on you know, certain conditions, if it's hot or cold. Number four, what percentage of a human body is water? Well, at birth, the water accounts for about 80% of an infant's body weight. But as adults, we 
are around 66% water, so about two-thirds water. Number five, 80% of the Earth's surface is water, leaving 20% for us to live here. None of us have grown gills yet. <laughs> I don't think we will. Number six, I know we won't. 75% of the human brain is water. And 75% of a living tree is water. And finally, the last one, we find dinosaur bones. Well, not us personally, unless you're an archaeologist. But if you think about it, the same water that the dinosaurs were drinking back when they were alive is the same water that we have today. So we are actually drinking some of the water that dinosaurs drink. Kind of a crazy thing to think about. I think that water plays a very interesting role in our lives. Even when we don't think about it and we don't realize it. It's one of the little things that we take for granted, being able to grab a nice cup of water. You know, there's some people that even, don't even like drinking water. It's very unfortunate, because water is very good for you. There are also those who don't like uh, taking showers or baths. It's also very unfortunate, because it's very good to be clean. But it's one of those things that God has created, and it stands to be wondered at. You know, the Bible mentions water 722 times, uh, more, almost more than anything else in the Bible. So let's dive into the Bible and see what we can fish out. Your terrible dad joke for the day. You know, as I was writing this sermon, I thought about uh, water in three main ways. There's lots of different ways that water is talked about and used in the Bible, but there's three ways that I wanted to use that seem to be used in a very spiritual sense. And so the first way is in baptism. You see, when we are called by God, and the Bible very specifically tells us that it is his calling and his alone as to why we are drawn by him. And it is after uh, counseling and meditation, deep thinking and prayer and reading that we make this commitment to become baptized. And this is because commitment is needed when we become baptized. Because baptism is the only way that we are made into the begotten children of God. Of course, we are not yet spirit. We're not yet spirit beings like a God and Christ are. But once we become baptized, we come to have their spirit living within us, hopefully growing within us. And so we have Christ's very own words that show the magnitude of this operation. In John chapter 3 and verse 5, we see John chapter 3 and beginning in verse 5. Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Very plain, very simple. Without baptism, underwater, and the laying on of hands, we would not receive the Holy Spirit. And we would not be able to become God beings who will be brought into God's kingdom. You know, the symbology here is very immense. We go into the water. We go underneath the water fully. And in that moment, it's an act of faith. If we were kept under that water indefinitely, we would die. Physically, we would no longer be alive. And so we die when we are baptized, in a sense. We die as people of this world, or at least we should. 
and we are raised from this watery grave, and we are supposed to live with a newness of life, with the Holy Spirit of God and with Christ living in and through us. And so we find in Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 3, what it has to say regarding this. Romans chapter 3 and beginning in verse 3, and we'll read to verse 6. And it starts by saying, Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized in Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? We talked about that already at the very start. Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man, that old person who went into the water, was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. This newness of life is similar to that of water. You see, one of the attributes of water is that in order for it to stay healthy and fresh, it needs to be constantly be moving, being refreshed, Otherwise, it becomes stagnant and gross and disgusting. If you ever smelled a pond or a puddle that's just been sitting there for a very long time, it's nasty. It it smells terrible. Not a lot of things will actually go there and live there. You know, interestingly, water is one of the, no, it is the only substance on earth that is present in all three states of matter. It is a solid, it is a liquid, and it is a gas. Similarly, the Holy Spirit is the only thing that brings about change within us. And so we have to constantly be seeking God's Spirit in our lives to be living this newness of life, to be living differently than the world around us. If you think about the fruits of the Spirit, those attributes of the Spirit, they have to be constantly being renewed within us. They have to constantly be growing within us for us to be using them. Without that, it becomes stagnant and useless. You know, baptism, in and of it by itself, it's not enough. For us. Yes, it is extremely important, but it doesn't guarantee that we will actually make it to become God beings. It's only one of the first steps. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 1, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 1, we read, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed him, and that rock was Christ. You know, the Israelites here went through a type of baptism. But yet they couldn't keep God's laws and his ways perfectly. They were constantly failing and sinning. You know, even Moses, who had God's Holy Spirit, disobeyed when he became angry. And in striking the rock while water gushed out, it was actually a symbol of Christ as that rock. And so Moses hitting the rock, in essence, hitting Christ, causing his sin or Christ's blood to be shed. 
So you see, just because we have the spirit within us, we have to be renewing it. It is not enough for it to just sit there. We still will break God's law. And so more water is needed for our lives. Which brings me to my second point, cleanliness. You know, when we, when we clean ourselves physically, it includes bathing or showering. And both these things require water. I've yet to see somebody become clean without going in a shower. Sure, you might get some dirt off, but you'll still have some stink on you. You know, and just because you take a shower or a bath once or maybe twice in your life, it doesn't mean that you're going to stay clean forever. And just as Mr. Link was talking about how important it is for spouses to love each other, as a spouse, you have to keep yourself clean. Otherwise, they will too will have something to say to you. I at times get the comment, you need a shower. And that's when I know I need to go take a shower. And we have all heard the saying that cleanliness is next to godliness. You know, without continually keeping ourselves clean, we once again become dirty. And this is in a physical and a spiritual sense. And there are a few ways that spiritually we can become clean. Obviously, at baptism, we are clean for a short period of time until we sin again. And then we have the annual Passover, where we watch, wash each other's feet with water. In type, once again, showing our commitment towards our baptism and our willingness to allow Christ's sacrifice to cover us and to wash away our sins and our filthiness. In John chapter 13 and verse 10, Christ says, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. So we see, again, Christ here saying that in order for us to start on that path of becoming clean, we have to become baptized. But then he goes on to say that in keeping the Passover and in doing the things that he instituted, including washing of the feet, we can continually remove filth and sin from our lives. Another way, one of the greatest ways that we can continue to do this it's based on what the Bible shows us. And that is within the word of God. Mr. Link used this scripture, but we're going to go here again. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. Ephesians 5 and verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Christ's sacrifice gives us the opportunity to be cleansed and to be washed by the involvement of the Word of God in our lives. See, the Word of God is there for us to use, to use to become holy, to become without blemish, without spots of sin. When we continually use and think about God's Word, it helps us to look at our lives and to make different decisions, different choices as life happens. Continuing on with this idea of cleanliness based on the word of God, we see in Psalm 119 and verse 9, 
How can a young man cleanse his way? How can he make his paths good? How can he be washed? And it says, by taking heed according to your word. Minding God's word. Paying attention to it. Thinking about it. How it applies in life as we move through it. And in John 15, in verse 3, Christ says in John 15, verse 3, You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Again, the cleanliness that can continue is if we are staying within the word of God. Again, if we are thinking about this way of life, if we are adhering to it, You know, just as our bodies need water to survive physically, so we need this word of God to live spiritually. We will turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11. First Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11 says... And such were some of you. He's talking about people of this world and how they act, what they do, what they think. And such were some of you. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. And then turning over to Titus chapter 3 and beginning in verse 5. chapter 3, uh, Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Not by the works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This scripture made me smile when I read it. Because when we have hard days, when we go through tough things, if we turn to scripture and we read something like this, then there's some there's a sense of peace that comes. You know, regeneration means something that regrows, something that regrows like a lost part so that the original function is restored. You can think of a starfish can regenerate a new limb. Renewing means to resume after an interruption or extend, or extend for a further period the validity of a license or a contract. Mr. Michael Link read uh, Psalm 119 and verse 40, which says, Revive in me your righteousness. You know, the Holy Spirit within us coming from God helps us to grow or to regrow to continue on that path, even when we go through hard and challenging things and feel like maybe we've failed and fallen and and maybe it feels like it's impossible to get up and keep going. It's saying here, no, you can keep going. You can be rejuvenated. And how many times do we need that? And how many times can we, can we get that rejuvenation from God? All the time, according to what the Bible is telling us. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22, this idea is continued. Ephesians 4 and beginning of verse 22. 
that you put off according to your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts. You see, that old man can grow too, if we let it. Verse 23, but be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God, in righteousness and holiness. That is what we are continued, supposed to continue to grow We will turn to Hebrews chapter 10, and we'll begin in verse 19. Hebrews chapter 10, and beginning in verse 19. And it says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. We have to have boldness to live this way, to come to God in prayer and ask him for this rejuvenation. Continuing, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Mr. Link just mentioned that we see that day approaching even faster than we have ever before. Therefore, the scripture should really apply to us even more now than when it was written. we have the opportunity to draw near to God, to be washed with this pure water from whatever it is that is holding us back, that is causing us to be dirty in God's eyes. The also thing can be said that when we are living this way of life and we're working to keep ourselves clean and, or to become cleaner, the opportunity to help each other up and forward is there. And it's a part of helping us to stay clean. We owe it to each other to be exhorting, to be lifting each other up, to be encouraging each other forward and pushing, helping each other push through the things that are happening in this life, giving encouragement. You know, we are each here for a reason, doing our part. So let's not forget that it's not just about us. It's also about who is around us, who we are connected to, because that is just as important as just the self. Which leads me to my last point, everlasting water and living water. You see, when Christ died, he didn't just die for me or for you. He did it for everybody. The entire world who doesn't even know him, he did it for them. And so I love this idea that water is something that is tied to who and what Christ is and what he provides for us now and into our future. In Matthew chapter 5, we find the Beatitudes. And I looked up what the Beatitude, Beatitudes means, just that word, Beatitudes. And the uh, learningreligions.com said, the word Beatitude comes from the Latin Beatitudo, meaning blessedness. The phrase, blessed are, in each of the Beatitudes implies a current state of happiness or well-being. This expression held a powerful meaning of divine joy and perfect happiness to the people of Christ's day. So when we read chapter or verse 6 of chapter 5, 
this stands out. Blessed are those who hunger and who thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. filled. What happens when you get hungry or when you get thirsty? You actively go and you seek nourishment. And what happens if you don't find food or water? You start to get grumpy or antsy. <laughs> when my kids need water, it's like the world is coming to an end. I mean, you should hear them in the back seat of the car, I'm thirsty! You'd think they were going to die, right? But that's what Christ is stating here. That if we act like we are hungry and we are thirsty for the word of God, for righteousness, then we will be happy. Then we will be blessed. We will find perfect joy, perfect happiness if we are hungry and thirsty for that. But see, this is not the only place where Christ makes this statement. Notice these next verses. In Isaiah chapter 5, 55 and verse 1, he says, Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. John 7 and verse 37. On that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Verse 38, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. In another scripture, Christ had talked about how if the woman had asked him for living waters, she would have received it. That same living water that he is talking about should be flowing from each of us through righteousness, through blessedness, through joy and happiness. John 4 and verse 14. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. You see, the opportunity to have living water springing up in us is now. It's not just in the future, although this absolutely covers it happening in the future as well. Also notice that it says, it will become in him like a fountain of water. It's not that it's already there. It's that it's a process of coming. You know, just drinking once from God's word isn't enough. We have to continually go back to that source, continually go to that original fountain, Which leads me to realize that, as I was going on, that this water is, is, is in us now, but it's also going to be very significant in the future for us and for the entire world. Starting in Revelation chapter 7 and beginning in verse 13, we read this, Revelation Chapter 7 and verse 13. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. 
For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And in Revelation 21 and verse 6, we heard this one as well. And he said to them, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of life a freely to him who thirsts. In the first scripture there in Revelation, it is those who are coming out of the great tribulation. They will be able to take from this water of life. Unfortunately, brethren, we don't, we don't want to be those who have to go through that time. But there is going to be those who are going to go through that time. But they will have the fountain of water to drink from eventually. In Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 1, we read this. In that day... A fountain will be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanliness. As we know, that term in that day or that day is a reference to the time just prior to and at Christ's return. And it can include the time after Christ has returned. So this fountain of water will start to be available to those who are coming out of the tribulation. In Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 22, we read this. Ezekiel 36, 22. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. And then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all of your idols. I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. And I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will keep my judgments and do them. quite the future that we look forward to. I wish that time could be now. I look at the things that are happening in this world and it just it breaks your heart to read our updates every single week. I was <laughs> going to work this morning and I was my wife was coming in. I was just irate with frustration about something that I had been listening to. It's heartbreaking. But as we look to the future with the kingdom of God being established, there's still a little bit more water mentioned. And it paints a phenomenal scene that just should take your breath away. In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 1, it says... Then he showed me a river of the water of life. Clear as crystal coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. In chapter 22 and verse 17, 
and the Spirit and the Bride, you and I say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts, come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. But then we have the opportunity of a lifetime to drink now from the fountain of life. We are responsible for how thirsty we are, how much zeal we put in seeking for this fountain. Now, people have been seeking for a fountain of youth or eternal life throughout the ages, but very few have actually found that fountain. How surprised will people be when they finally get the opportunity to understand and to drink from water that is pure, that is true, and that is going to be truly amazing? 